Hi and welcome to this uh, video on uh, insulation coordination, the lightning part. So in this video we are going to uh, see how to perform an insulation coordination in EMTP and uh, especially uh, and focus of course on the lightning. Uh, so before watching this video, I uh, highly recommend you to take a look at the, the other recorded video, which is called uh, Origin and Classification of uh, Over Voltages. I will do some uh, reminders uh, here, but uh, to fully understand the content of this video, it's uh, highly recommended to watch this, this first one. Um, okay, so, well, first of all, um, if you, uh, the first reminder actually from this video, it's about the different type of over voltages uh, that are like uh, uh, very fast transients uh, over voltages, which uh, are actually the fastest. Then you have the fast front over voltage, which are lightning over voltages. You have switching over voltages and uh, temporary over voltages, which are the slowest, like typically uh, fundamental frequency over voltage, like a, a single phase ground fault or uh, load rejection and fair resonance. Why it is important, again, to repeat, so why it is important to uh, classify those over voltages? It's because an apparatus will withstand a certain level according to the uh, shape of the over voltage. For lightning over voltage, the, uh, the surge is very steep. And so you will have here a time from zero to peak, which is very short. In this condition, the apparatus will withstand a higher overvoltage compared to a switching overvoltage where the time to peak is much slower. And so it means that the maximum level, which for lightning is called a BIL, basic impulse level, the, this level is, diff, is higher than for a switching level. Okay, so here you can see approximately the dynamic of this uh, search for lightning, the classification. Um, so basically, when we're going to do a, an analysis, uh, we do a simulation or uh, even if you have something a real lightning strike on field, we kind of assume that the shape of the over voltage we will have will be close enough to the lab test, all equipment, are doing are, uh, all the tests and equipment have, have passed through and so that the level uh, the BIL which was obtained by lab measurements uh, so to determine the BIL we assume that for the any shape of lightning strike we will get during the simulation or on field will be similar and so the same level can be assumed Okay, so uh, there are several types of uh, lightning over voltages. Uh, first of all, you have the induced over voltage. Um, this is mostly, uh, this mostly affects distribution network. It's when the lightning strike does not strike directly the line, but something close by and you have an over voltage on the line. Uh, for that, there are some tools. Actually, we have one here, which is called a LIOV, L-I-O-V. Uh, which is used in this purpose, but that's not what we're going to do today. Then you have what is called um, uh, the lightning strike. So uh, when the lightning strike on a chill wire, so you have the tower and at the top you have two ground wire, which are called a chill wire. Those are designed to capture lightning. And so you may have over voltages when the voltage rises so high on those chill wire that you have a flashover between the ground and the phase. And because it is because between the ground and the phase, it's called a back flashover. And so that's typically what we study when we do EMT simulation, EMTP simulations or uh, we study this case, the back flashover. So we'll apply a lightning strike on the tower top uh, on the chill wire. In some region of the world uh, where the, um, the lightning density isn't so high, um, it's not economic. It doesn't make sense economically to put those shielding wires or to, to perfectly protect a line. Very often, you will need two shielding wires. Uh, so often, you will put only one or none according to 
um, again, uh, some economical uh, uh, consideration, and if you don't have so many lightnings on the region. And so in this case, it may happen that the lightning strikes straight on a phase without striking the shielding. This is, called a, this is called a direct strike or a shielding failure. So this is also something you have to study in EMTP and make sure that the, the over voltage, um, uh, the whole, there is no too bad over voltage for that. Um, typically, we don't study lightning striking inside a substation because we assume that the substation is protected and you have lightning mast, which will capture the lightning. And so the uh, electrical apparatus are uh, safe inside the substation. So when you do the EMTP simulation, you have a device which is a lightning strike, which we will see later in the video, which is a current source. You will connect this current source on the incoming transmission lines, but not inside the substation. So the objective of an EMTP study here, um, there will be several things. If you talk about transmission line itself, you will come out with what is called the line performance, which is the flash over rate of an overhead line. Okay, you have a transmission line. Uh, how often you will have a backflash over or shielding failure. Um, and so this is typically like a number of ones per 100 years, 200 years, and so on. It can be much less or much more. So this is for transmission lines. Uh, then if you talk about equipment inside substations, now we are going to determine the rate of failure. Uh, if you have, so the first step will be, you will have a backflash over on the line, and then this backflash over will create an overvoltage on phases, which will propagate to the substation and may damage equipment. Okay, so there we will see in this uh, video the procedure to determine that. And finally, it's also to determine uh, the surge resistor ratings, um, so the, the switching, uh, the lightning uh, surge, uh, the impulse level of the, uh, the surge arrestor, but also the position of the surge arrestor. And this is crucial for lightning. Um, one thing you have to remind, remember, which is important, is that for lightning, the substation is actually a circuit. And you don't assume that the voltage is the same at each point in the substation which means that if you have a substation connected to a transformer, but there is a conductor in between during a lightning strike, the voltage at the, at the point of connection of the surge arrestor will not be the same as the one of the point of connection of the transformer because the lightning strike travels through the substation, propagates through the substation. All right, so some definitions, uh, many of them I've already discussed. Uh, so you have uh, the first thing which is called a direct lightning strike. So it's when the lightning strike directly on the phase uh, of a transmission line without hitting the shielding wire. The back flashover, it's a flashover between ground and phase. So when the lightning strike the neutral wire, the top of the tower, and you have, uh, I mean, at the top of the tower or in between, it doesn't matter. Um, you will have the flash, so you, the voltage will rise, then the voltage difference between the ground and the phase wire will be high and you will have a flash over in between. So this is a back flash over. Then you have the back flash over rate, which is the number of back flash over of a line per 100 kilometers. So you take a, a section of line per year. So this will depend of the, on the tower geometry and on the ground density of lightning in the region. The, grounds of, the ground density is how often you get lightning strikes. Uh, for example, if you are in, uh, you know, in the in the Louisiana region in the U.S., here you have a very high lightning uh, lightning strike ground density. Whereas if you are more up north, uh, you know, in the west coast of Canada, it's much uh, lower. Okay, then we will uh, see together how to determine what is called the critical current. The critical current it's when you will apply a lightning strike during the simulation on at a certain point on the incoming line. So typically you will have the substation, all the incoming line, the incoming line, and you will put the lightning strike close uh, on the line, close by the substation, within few miles or even less, you know, hundreds of uh, meters or miles. Uh, you will put the lightning strikes here. And the critical current will be the minimum peak current of this lightning strike 
which will cause a failure in the substation. So for that, you will have to know, of course, the withstand level of uh, all equipment, which are called the BIL, the basic uh, lightning impulse insulation level. So you will need to know those values, uh, simulate the lightning strike, monitor the voltage at, at each point uh, in the substation and see if the voltage reach this maximum level. And if it's the case, then uh, you are above the critical current. And so it will be, we will run several simulations in order to determine the critical current at each point of the um, of this uh, incoming line. Actually, at some point, when you go further and further away from the substation, this critical current becomes very high. It can be more than 200 kiloamps. Uh, at some point, when it's over 200 kiloamps, we, well, according to standard, we assume that it's not possible anymore. And so that's, that means that such a lightning strike does not exist. It's too high or it's, uh, the probability is much too low. So you, 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 you will say that at this point, no lightning would, uh, no, no, no lightning would create a damage in the substation. And this, this point, uh, this uh, distance from the substation to uh, on the line where you, have, you reach a critical current of 200 kiloamps, it's called the critical distance. We will see that later uh, again. OK, so we discuss here the BIL, the BSL. Um, so the BIL, the definition is um, it, it's, it gives a probability of uh, the withstand probability of 90%. However, you will see for um, if you watch the video of, of the switching insulation coordination, it's a, a little different for lightning because basically the, the level of lightning for the difference between 90% of withstand and 50% of withstand, it's almost nothing. And so typically for lightning, uh, because the statistical distribution of the withstand voltage is so narrow, even, even for uh, internal or external insulation, uh, we will use uh, 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 just one, a single level, which will be the level to design of design. And if you get an overvoltage above this level, then uh, you get uh, you get a damage and or, or a flash of backflash over. So it will be uh, a bit easier than uh, compared to switching, where you have some equipment like insulators, which are called non-self-restoring um, insulation, and which have a, a which have a statistical behavior and force us to cross different statistical ropes. Okay, so the limit distance is actually what I called before the critical distance. I apologize, the real name is limit distance. So again, this is when you apply lightning strikes on the line, you find the critical distance. And at some point, the, the, the critical current will be higher than 200 kiloamps. So this, is, this point here is the limit distance. We will repeat that again uh, later to make sure it's clear. OK, so then you have what is called the maximum shielding current. Uh, we, will, we will discuss what is the max, maximum shielding current in the next slides. Uh, just a quick introduction to that. When you will see, you have your phase conductor protected, protected by a shielding current. And you will see the theory, but the bottom line is for low uh, lightning current, you are more likely to get a chilling failure than for uh, high lightning current. And actually, when the lightning current is very high, you, you, most of them, you don't have chilling failure. And so the limit between that is the maximum chilling current. It's the highest magnitude of lightning current, which may cause uh, a chilling failure. So we will see the theory right after. So don't worry if it's not so clear. All right, then you have the representative lightning stroke current, which is the minimum value of lightning current at a specific point of impact, which produces over voltages that the equipment has to withstand. All right, so then, like I said, you will do this study and you will come out with some uh, uh, line performance or, uh, so for line performance, uh, the outcome of the study will be the number of flashover per 100 kilometers and per year. Then for substation, it will be the mean time between failure. 
And so you have here some typical uh, performance criterion here for uh, EHV and HV system or here for different type of substation. Of course, here, of course, here there is an economical problem, uh, like it, it's a trade-off be between uh, economical concern and failures. Um, in order to increase the mean time between failure and a substation, either you get equipment with higher BIL, which costs, of course, more, and which are more expensive, or uh, you put more surge arresters, uh, or you change the tower design, so all that has a cost. Uh, when you have one failure every 500 years, uh, you know, that's why you maybe wonder why would I spend more money on that. So it's, it's really like a, a trade-off between economical concern and design. Okay, so again, how we are going to uh, do that in the MTP. So the first step will be to model completely the design. Uh, so let's take a simple example where we have one substation with one incoming line. So we are going to, um, to uh, um, place a lightning strike or current source at the top of this line and at several points going further and further away. For each point where we apply this current source, we will um, we will vary the, um, the the current the lightning strike peak current. So we will vary it in order to find the limit between failure or no failure. If I have a, a peak current lower than this point, I have no failure. If I have a peak current higher than this point, I have a failure. So that's again the critical current. You will be supposed to do that at each point on the line, but of course, to simplify it, what we're going to do is to cut the line into section. Um, very often, what is done is we do that at each tower top, but uh, it, it's also common to do it at the tower top and at the middle of the line. And so that's how you will sectionize your line and apply the lightning strikes, just because you cannot apply continuously. It will be much too, way too much cases, and it's not so relevant. Okay, so after the MTP study, you will have the critical uh, current at each tower. Um, so if you, uh, if you do actually lightning on the cable system, so of course the lightning will not strike the cable system, but it may, for example, strike on the overhead line and then propagate to the cable system through, um, well, through a transformer or uh, in this case, it's the voltage between sheets and ground, which uh, which may cause the, the flashover. Uh, you may want to monitor also the arrestor energy. So uh, that's all the outputs of any of the MTP simulation. Okay, so the lightning, uh, the lightning, we have different lightning model in the MTP. Uh, the one recommended by standard is the Seagray model. So the Seagray model has a certain shape. Um, some people do studies with double exponential. Um, it's not necessarily recommended to use that because um, double exponentials are actually the, the, the surge, the current surge which are used for testing. Uh, but uh, according to Seagray, IEC, and IEEE, it's recommended to use this Seagray model for lightning strike. But both can be used. The two models are, there, are here in the MTP. Okay, so now um, okay, so now let's discuss a little bit the tower geometry. So remember, I in, in the introduction I explained that um, when you have a lightning strike, according to the lightning intensity, you may hit the chilling wire or the phase. And when you have a lower um, a lower intensity, you're more likely to hit the 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 phase and have a shielding failure. So why is that? Well, it's because when you have a conductor or uh, any metallic uh, metallic structure, which is a conductor, you have a, an attractive radius. The attractive radius is a radius. If a lightning strike enter it, the lightning strike will end up on the metallic structure. So having this uh, chilling wire, or sometimes you have two, having those create kind of like a cylinder over the line. And if the light, a lightning strike enters this cylinder, it goes into the chilling wire. And this 
circle, this uh, attractive radius depends on the, uh, the lightning current intensity. And so for low intensity, uh, for low intensity lightning strike, you will have a smaller radius, whereas for high intensity lightning strike, you have a very large radius. And that's why this large radius at the, on the conductors at the top of the tower, we basically cover the entire line and protect completely the line. I will show you a drawing after, which will uh, and repeat the explanation. Okay, so then uh, the, the, so the lightning distance, it's the distance between an object on Earth and a lightning leader within which the li lightning must approach be before the, the point of strike is determined. And so for this, um, for, for this attractive radius, you have several models that exist in the literature. Um, some of them depend on the current, some of them depend also on the height. Um, so it, it may depend on both height and current. Okay, so those are important factors to consider when the tower will be designed and to determine again the, 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 the mean time between failure and the line performance. So also if, if the goal is to determine how much lightning is going to strike your line. Okay, so try to imagine to see seeing the, the line from the top, you have the chilling wires, and those chilling wires create uh, a cylinder, an attractive radius, so a big cylinder. And when you know the regional ground density, so how, how much lightning strike per year, and you see this, uh, the ground cover from this line seen from the top, that's how you can calculate how many lightning will strike your line per year. And of course, this will depend again on the lightning density because the lightning density will enlarge the, um, enlarge the radius. Okay, so let's put a drawing behind all that so it's easier to understand. Here you have your transmission line with phase A, B, and C. Here you have two chilling wires. Uh, then you have here your uh, uh, attractive, ra attractive radius. Okay, so you see the attractive radius. Here you have the equation uh, which is used actually, which we'll use here for the, for the webinar of today, which is the Ritz uh, from April. And this one depends on the height and the current. Okay, so assume any lightning strike, for example, 100 amps lightning strike. So you have I. You have the tau, the height of this conductor, and that's how you calculate the radius. Then you have this radius here. You do the same thing for the second shield wire, and you have this second radius here. You do the same thing for the phase, and you have here the radius around the phase. For a low current, here you see that you will have a possibility is a lightning, a lightning leader is coming from the top here, of course, coming from the top. If it enters this zone, which is the striking distance, it will end up in the, on the conductor. Whereas if it enters this zone, it will end up there. And if the lightning intensity is very high, RC is going to increase. And so here B will end up coming in top of A. And so then you will have no chance for any lightning to go, to, uh, to go on, the, on the phase. And so you will have no chilling failure. Okay, and so this is called the, um, well, whatever. <laughs> All right, so yes, yeah, so that's um, on the geometry point of view. So that's what is important. So in a in a country where you don't have so much uh, ground, uh, where you have a very low high, uh, where, where you have a very low um, uh, ground density of lightning, you will have only one chilly wire at the in the middle. And so basically, if you have a very high lightning strike, you will have a very large radius which will protect your line. But for lower um, uh, level of lightning strike sometimes you will have chilling failure, but it's okay because they are at lower level of uh, lightning intensity and so they may not cause the damage. That's the whole point of doing the study here. Okay, so if, if we repeat a little bit the procedure here, and for that I will pop a, an EMTP example. 
Okay, so here you have a simplified model of substation, and we come back to that. We never apply a lightning strike on the substation because we assume the substation is protected by uh, lightning mast, and so which will capture every lightning possible trying to strike the substation. So what, here, the, this is the end of the substation on this side, and so we this tower is still protected in the substation. So we start applying lightning strike on the line. Here, in our case, we will try to apply on each tower. So here you see three lightning strikes, but it's actually one after the other. So let first, so we can forget those two here. Can actually delete them. So first, we um, we apply on the first tower. We vary the intensity, so we have no failure in here. So we monitor the voltage. Uh, if the over voltage during the simulation remains below the BILs, it means there is no failure. If it goes above, there is a failure. It means there is a failure. So we'll vary. For example, for this point, we will get uh, 75 kilo amps for failures. Well, so if this is the limit, if I apply a lightning strike below 75, there is no failure. And if I apply a, a lightning strike above 75, there is a failure. Now it means 75 is my critical current. Then I go, and I will assume it's the same critical current for all this section, for the line here and for half the line here. Then I will place this lightning strike on the next next tower and do the same thing. Because I'm further away, here now the, light, the, um, the critical current will be a bit higher, maybe 100. And I will assume it's the same critical current for all that. If you don't like this assumption, you're free to apply the lightning in between and cut this line into section and apply the lightning in between. And I will go like that step by step until the critical current is above 200 kilo amps. Then, like we said, we assume this is a case which has a probability which is too low to be considered. And so now we have our critical distance. So for example, let's assume here the critical current is 210. Okay, then it means we don't consider this tower and uh, and the critical distance will be the length of all those sections, those spans, up to this half line. Okay, so that will be the first step to find the critical current at each point. Then what do you do with that? Then you determine the number of chilling failure. So it will depend on several things. The ground density, the what we call here and NG, the regional ground flash density, multiplied by uh, L1. L1 is the length of the line, so the total length of the line. And um, DC is the exposure distance. Here, actually, I uh, sorry, I, I wasn't so clear and I got misled myself as well. Here, what in this slide, what we show is how to determine the shielding failure. So the changing failure, the goal here is to find the maximum current which may create a shielding failure. Okay, so you understand that as you higher I, the, uh, the radius here increases and at some point D becomes zero. So that's the goal here is to find what is the maximum current which may create a, a shielding failure. So that's how we do that. Uh, we find... Um, we calculate basically here um, the, the limit. So the limit will be IM. IM for which there is no there is D equals zero. And then we'll do an integral of the length of the line multiplied by D, which is here, multiplied by two, of course, because it's two sides. And um, and then the, uh, the so the length D multiplied by two and the ground density. So you have this equation here. You do the integral from um, the critical current to um, the critical current to the maximum shielding failure, and that's how you get the shielding failure rate. Okay. So the critical current is calculated um, is calculated by EMTP. So you get those critical current the way we explained, and uh, you can do that for the line. The critical current here will depend on the section. So you may do this per section and get the shielding failure per section and add them up together. As um, if you if you'd like to um, simplify your life, you may also here calculate 
the chilling current like that. If you know the surge impedance of the line, you may calculate here, um, you may just use this calculation and, and without doing the simulation in EMTP. Here, when we determine the chilling failure, it's actually for the line performance. So that's why in this calculation, we don't really consider the substation. We consider U50, which is the critical uh, flashover, um, the critical flashover voltage of the line. And so we just assume a failure on the line. Okay, so when you have this chilling failure rate, you only focus on the line. If then the goal is to focus on the substation, you consider the critical current uh, of which will create a flashover in the substation. Okay, so here by design, if you want a perfect shielding, then you have to set here the, the critical current equal to IM, or you have to as um, you have to arrange the geometry of the line. So IM, which is the value of intensity where D is zero, you make sure that um, IM equal IC. All right, so now let's uh, quickly discuss how to uh, model everything in EMTP. So first of all, a lightning study is uh, something very local. Uh, because it is local, um, uh, you don't need to model the entire uh, system of a country to study lightning. Uh, it's mostly you will uh, uh, you will uh, uh, model everything in a radius of few miles or few kilometers close to the substation where you want to analyze lightning. So if we take a look quickly here at a, an EMTP model, you have the substation. Here we assume there is only one incoming line to have a simplified case, but in reality you may have several. And you, you see here we have several steps, and at some point we don't model anymore. Uh, when we stop modeling, uh, there is one thing important to do. Uh, when you apply your lightning on the tower, for example, let's say here you move this lightning and you put it at this point. When you apply the lightning, you know the lightning strike will create a surge, a surge voltage. The surge voltage will travel through the line and reflect. Of course, here if you stop modeling here, you have to make sure when you apply the lightning strike that it doesn't come here and come back. That it doesn't go here and come back. So what we typically do for that is we will here put a section of transmission line which is long enough so the lightning never comes back. So typically you will put 50 kilometers or 20 kilometers and that should be enough. The second strategy is to use an ideal voltage source with an impedance which is equal to the surge impedance of the line. Uh, but again, to simplify, in my opinion, the easiest is to take the same Transmission line here, but generated for a very long, uh, a very long uh, section of 20 or 50 kilometers. And uh, when so when you do the simulation, the lightning strikes goes there and never have time to come back before the end of the simulation. Okay, so that's how you will model boundaries in your system. Uh, you put an ideal voltage source. It's a good idea also to adjust here the phase angle to get worse case. Right, so basically, when you do the simulation, uh, you, you do one simulation and you, you adjust your voltage source to get the maximum over voltage in the substation and then you keep them like this. So this is something you do at the beginning, but then once you have determined what's the worst case, uh, you just keep it like that. All right, then the, for transmission lines, um, it's recommended to use a frequency dependent model or even better, wide band models. So I, to, uh, to model them, uh, I don't go too much into detail. We have specific videos on how to create transmission lines. One thing here is that you see we model each span individually. So you have, uh, so you, you typically for a switching study or other type of study, you will model the entire line in one uh, device. But here it's really each section. So you will have uh, the three phases and the chilling wires. In this example, we have only one chilled wire. You see it's here number one. And then you have phase A, B, and C. And so we repeat this section several times. So that's how you do that. 
Then you also need to model the tower. We'll come back on the tower model later, uh, but we will have to do it. Uh, basically for that, we use a lossless uh, propagation line with a footing resistance, we'll see after, which is a CP model. Very often, actually, when you try to create a frequency dependent model or a wideband model for a very short section of line, so one span, which is, you know, 100 meters or so, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, often it's very tough for the frequency dependent algorithm to fit that. And you, it may not be able to fit it or may require a very, very high number of poles to do that and create numerical problems. If that happens, one thing that can be done is instead of generating a frequency dependent model of line, you enter all the tower configuration, so the position of each conductor on space and all that, but instead of generating the FD, you generate a constant parameter line and you, uh, you generate that for uh, 50 kilohertz. So the parameters, resistance, and backlance capacitance are evaluated uh, for 50 kilohertz. It's, it's okay in one sense because, I mean, it, it, it's fine to work like that because the lightning strike is very high frequency. The other frequency present during the study is the, the 60 hertz or 50 hertz frequency, which for such a speed, it looks like a DC voltage in here. So that's why it's fine to do that. If you study, if the, um, if you want to be very precise, you may also model the, um, the corona effect. The corona effect will give a capacitive behavior to your line, which will um, lower the steepness of the, um, of the over voltage. So it's a good idea to use that if you want to be precise, especially for very high voltage. If you don't, you will be conservative, so it's fine as well. Okay, so for air gap, it's, uh, it's important to model the air gap, of course, because that's what will create the, the flash over. So when the air gap is short, you can assume that as soon as there is a uh, flash over, it's like an idle switch closing. Whereas if it's a long air gap, more than one meter, then it's important to reproduce the leader propagation, which we add more delay and add an impedance to this uh, arc. Okay, now how do we model the substation itself? Um, everything must be modeled, basically. Each section of conductor must, must be modeled. If it's more than 10 meters, uh, so approximately 30 feet, um, then you should use a CP line. So for the, in the CP line, we will enter the characteristic impedance and the length of this line. Uh, then you can assume a, um, a traveling wave and the um, propagation speed uh, of about 80% of the speed of light. Uh, this, this is for air insulated substation. For gas insulated substation, it may be slightly different. Um, then, if you have a conductor shorter than that, uh, then simply use a, a, an inductance with a typical value of 1 micro Henry per meter. For GIS, typically the, the surge impedance is about 60 to 80 ohm um, for those sections of line. Whereas for air insulated substation, it will be 150, 200. Then you have to place the surge capacitance of every single equipment. Um, if you have a bus bar, you have to put the surge capacitance. If you have a transformer, a CT, uh, an open breaker, a closed breaker, every single equipment has to be represented by a surge capacitance. Uh, you can find typical value of surge capacitance in uh, IEEE standard. We actually have a device which is called a stray capacitance, which is a library, uh, a database of stray capacitance, so you can use this device as well. Okay, so it's the same for transformers. Um, to, it's possible actually to be even more precise for transformer and to use a, a high frequency model of transformer. So that if you have done a frequency test where the the open circuit impedance of the transformer is measured for a wide range of frequencies, then you may get these impedance data, impedance versus frequency, and create a frequency dependent impedance to reproduce your uh, transformer. So that's, uh, that's something feasible. Often it's not done for, for lightning studies because it's a lot of work, but uh, to be precise, it's possible to do that. 
For surge registers, it's very important here to use a frequency dependent model of surge register. Uh, so there is a specific video on how to create those frequency dependent model. I will come back to them uh, quickly after, but uh, yeah, keep that in mind. And the lightning source also is a Segway source. The lightning current source is a Segway source. Okay, so at the end of the day, if you see a substation like that, it will look like this, where you have Anytime you have here a conductor, you will model it with a CP line. Uh, here, even very short conductors were modeled with CP line, three meters. It's okay. It will force to use a very small uh, time step to simulate that, but it's extra precision. Uh, you see that each equipment are modeled by a capacitance, and uh, you have surgery stored at some point. Okay, so the lightning strike here, you can find it if you go to um, if you go to sources. Here you can grab what is called Segre current source. So this is our lightning strikes. Even better, what I would recommend you to do is to use this example, which is uh, available on our Exchange platform. Um, you can uh, contact the technical support to get it. And uh, to use this model, because in this model, you only enter the uh, the peak current of lightning strike, for example, here 10,000, and automatically it will address all other parameters. Uh, so the steepness and uh, the tail duration. So it's it's pretty nice. You don't need to um, you don't need to calculate all that yourself. Okay, so it's uh, the current source looks like this. So you have several parameters: the peak current, uh, you have the Time the TF here, which is uh, which, well, you can see what it is in the in this figure. Uh, you have uh, the steepness. This is kind of important and a major difference compared if you do the lightning strike using this model compared to a double exponential model. Uh, the steepness will not be the same, and as you know, the steepness of current has a huge impact on over voltages. So that's why it's recommended to use this model. Um, also, typically in the lightning strike model, we put a resistance in parallel, and that's what we've done here in this little model. You have the Segre uh, model with this in parallel. Okay, so here you have some equations on how to calculate uh, current, steepness, and all the parameters. Um, if you here, yeah, actually, that's the, the summary of it. So the current, the steepness, the tail, the tail duration, and the time to get uh, sub, uh, t t thirty. Uh, don't remember what it is. It's a tf. Okay, so you have everything you need here. I'm not sure about TD30, but uh, what you need really is I, SM, TH, uh, and um, I would have to double check if TD30 is uh, TF, not sure about that. It's actually written in the, in the script of this device here. Uh, let's see if we can quickly find, out, find that out. TD30. Not sure if uh, TD30 is actually used in the, in the model. Oh yeah, it is TD30. No, I don't think TD30 is actually used in the, in the model itself. It's just uh, another parameter. Apologize, I don't remember what it is exactly. All right, so then, um, then you need to model the tower. Okay, later we keep going on the tower. So the tower, you will approximate that it's a cylinder, and then you will model, you will uh, calculate the surge uh, impedance based on the parameter of this of this cylinder. Okay, so the average radius, uh, the section here, H1, H2, if uh, the the radius is uh, if the radius is changing.
Okay, so then uh, what the way you are going to model that is to use a CP line. Uh, in the CP line, you put the surge impedance, uh, the propagation speed of 80, um, 80 percent of speed of light, and that's how you will model this tower. Let me show you how it is. Okay, so you see here that's our tower. Um, before actually showing you that, let me show you a little example, a drawing. You see you have a tower here, and so you have different sections for each section here, and the arms are also model. However, because the arms are very short, uh, we only use inductances for that. Uh, it's up to you. You may use CP line or inductances. You may do the calculation, the same calculation for the arms. It's fine to use inductances else. Uh, typically, it's a one micro Henry per meter for those sections. Okay, so this is our transmission line. Here you have all the faces, so phase A, B, and C, for example, and the top here is the tower top, so the chilling wire. That's where we'll apply the lightning strike. So when we apply a lightning strike, you see that it will travel through the line. It may create an overvoltage between here, the fa A phase and an overvoltage, and this is the air gap model where you may have a flashover. And here you have the grounding uh, pin of the of the tower where we will model the grounding resistance. Okay, so the grounding resistance is modeled as such. Um, when you have a lightning strike, you have a lot of current going through the ground, inside the ground, and that this creates what is called a ionization, which will vary the uh, resistance, the grounding resistance. And this is here the equation provided by IEEE for the grounding resistance. Uh, so you have, um, uh, here it depends on the lightning density and Ig, and Ig is a parameter calculated which depends on uh, the soil resistivity mostly and um, the footing resistance of at 60 Hertz, so this may be determined uh, by measurements, uh, and uh, the soil ionization gradient, so here we typically take this value 400. How do we model that now? Well, we just create a small control circuit. We use this controlled um, Norton equivalent where we set I, the current, at zero the whole time. So basically, it's just a control resistance. And you see, we measure here the current. Then we have the equation I just showed here, uh, you, the input U2, which is the footing resistance multiplied by square root of 2, 1 plus the current U1 divided by 18,500. So that's exactly this equation here. Okay, and, that, and so this will control the resistance. And here we have a small selector. Uh, when the intensity is lower than 18,500, then we consider the resistance is uh, the footing resistance. And when it's higher, we use this, uh, this calculation. Okay, so it's just a selector. Okay, so that's how we model that. Uh, again, this tower model is available uh, on demand. So if you have a lightning study to do, you simply use that and uh, modify it. This example is actually inside the MTP examples. All right, so now let's uh, discuss how do we model those insulators. Like I said, you have two possibilities, uh, which will mainly depend on the length of the, um, the insulator. Uh, there's one, the first method is when you have a voltage time curve, which means that the insulator will be able to withstand a certain voltage for a certain time only. And after this time, you will have the backlash over, so the breakdown. Uh, you may have this curve here. Then one way you can do that is, again, the same way we've done for the resistance, uh, use a control um, use a, um, a control circuit to determine that. So you will enter those points in a table and uh, measure the current, create a timer, and when you reach the curve, basically close the gap. It's possible to do that, but it's not really what we recommend. It, it, it's possible to do it, but um, I will show you after other way to do it, which are easier. So the, the other model, which is recommended actually, is uh, for gaps which are lower than one meters or 1.2 meters. 
So here it uses an equation to determine if there is a flashover or not. So it's used the area criterion model. So according to the length, the, the size of your gap, okay, you have those parameters and you can interpolate in between. And then uh, automatically the model conti continuously integrates the difference between V gap and V0, so the voltage bit in the in the gap in the at the insulator terminal versus uh, V0 here. And uh, when these integral become larger than G, it has a closed ideal switch. So the, the current will now go through, the, uh, go through this gap and the voltage on the phase and the neutral and the ground will be the same. Okay, so this model is valid for, um, is valid for smaller gap. And you can find it here in the library switches and it's called um, air gap. All right, so that's the model we used here in this line model. It's right there. Okay, the second model to use, uh, you, you can use, it's for larger gaps, more than one meters, more, more than one meter. So this one is um, uh, now we produce the leader propagation. Okay, so it will actually take when there is a flashover, it will take some time for the flashover to go from this point to here, and there will be a, a, a resistance associated with that. So here the equation is written there. Uh, the only input for this model will be the lens, uh, and the model is already built in the MTP. So you can simply uh, grab it from the library. Uh, you have here a, an example. If you go to application air gap leader, okay, the model is there and you can select here the lens. Okay, so again, this one is recommended to be used when you have a lens high, higher than one meter. Okay, so then you have the surge arrestor model. Here again, we did a, I repeat, we did a, a complete video on how to model surge arrestors. Uh, for lightning, it's important to use the uh, frequency dependent surge arrestor. So the frequency dependent surge arrestor is modeled like this as a combination of RLC uh, component and two nonlinear resistance, which have an exponential fitting. Uh, there is a procedure in order to build that. We actually have a device which does it, does it automatically for you. So the only things you will enter are the, uh, the um, impulse test results. So you have what is called V10 which is the voltage for a lightning surge of 10 kiloamps. The lightning surge takes 8 microseconds to go to the peak and uh, 20 microseconds to go to the top, so it's uh, 820. So you need this value, uh, and you need also a switching surge. So a switching surge which has, you know, for example, a 30, 60, so a surge which takes 30 seconds to go from zero to the peak, and then 60 uh, microseconds, sorry, microseconds for the tail. So you need those two uh, informations to build this model. Uh, it's basically some fitting, so we'll adjust those characteristics to match the switching uh, pulse, and then we'll adjust L1 here to match the lightning test. And so then this surge arrestor is valid for switching and lightning. So that's the one recommended. I will invite you to take a look at the video that we've done on server restore modeling to do that and download in our exchange platform the add-on uh, which does all that automatically. Yeah, so this, um, this model, uh, you enter basically all the information you need. Actually, I forgot you also need to know the number of columns in parallel and the length of the surge arrestor. Okay, so you enter all that in here and it will automatically create this model for you. So, fairly easy at the end of the day. Okay, so here you have the way it's, it's built if you want to do it yourself. Okay, so this we discussed already, the voltage source where you put a long transmission line to avoid uh, reflection. Okay, so let's sum up one more time, uh, what you have to do. So the first thing will be to apply, the light, apply lightning strike at different points to determine the critical current at, um, at each step. 
when you try to find the critical current, you compare the maximum voltage with the BIL of each equipment. But actually, remember that we have to consider the BIL with some safety coefficient, safety factor, amplitude, uh, correction factor, and all that. So what you're going to do is, when you monitor the over voltage, instead of comparing with the BIL, you will compare to the BIL divided by all these coefficients. So safety coefficient, safety factor, atmospheric correction factor, and altitude factor. The atmospheric correction factor depends on the pollution mostly. Right, so all that, take a look at the, um, the IEEE or IEC standard to see what the value of those coefficients, how to find them. We had a lot of references in the origin and classification of all voltage V. And so then when you have this, um, when you have the critical current at each tower, um, then you can uh, determine the mean time between failure. If you've watched the switching uh, insulation coordination video, you've seen that we have two methods, deterministic and statistical for non-self-restoring insulation and self-restoring insulation. But like I said at the beginning of this one, here there is no need. Um, for this, uh, for lightning, uh, you, can, you can use the deterministic method for all types of insulator because of the low dispersion of the uh, insulation character, the, the, withstand probability, the withstand voltage probability. Okay, so once you have uh, your critical current, you use here an, uh, um, a standard probability function to determine the probability to have such an intensity, such a, a current and intensity during lightning. For example, you remember I did here my simulation for the first hour, and I found 75 kilo amps for uh, the critical current. Then I use this equation here, and it will tell me the probability to have such a lightning. And I will assume it's the same probability for the entire distance covered by this tower. So basically, for half of, from half of this line to half of this line, I will assume this critical current just so I don't do so many simulations. You have to simplify the problem. And then uh, you have this probability for all this section of line. Then you do the same thing here, and you will have the same probability there. OK? So once you have the probability like that for each section, you can calculate the uh, annual number of, stro of, stro of strokes. OK, so for that, uh, the way you will calculate that is the grand density multiplied by, multiplied by twice Ra. Ra, I will go back here to show you what it is. Let me go back where I was. Okay, and B is the distance between each conductor. Okay, and so when you have so you have here the annual number of strokes, you multiply that by the probability you get for each section of line, uh, and um, kT it's an extra coefficient to add uh, in the uh, insulation coordination procedure, which depend on the uh, tower resistance. Okay, so you will adjust this T 60% or 100%. For if it's a high resistance tower, you use 100%. Else. 60% of chance. And so that's how you calculate now the uh, number of backflash over for each section of line. And uh, you do that for each span until the critical distance. And you can add up all these numbers uh, to finally get uh, the number of um, the, the, the annual number of backflash over. Okay, so it's, um, it seems like uh, it's difficult, but it's actually not so difficult. Okay, so if you need more um, readings, uh, you have here some references I recommend you to take a look at.